Good morning to all of you. I warmly welcome everyone for today's CPT program organized by Government Medical Officers Association and Society for Health Research and Innovation. The webinar link will be open to you until 10 a.m. and all late attendees will be entertained thereafter. You will be given CPD points, which are strictly adhered to NCCPD guidelines. Apart from CPD points, you will be given an e-certificate for participation. Each attendee should attend till the end of webinar to obtain the e-certificate. The link for applying e-certificate will be uh, sent to the chat box at the end of session. Also, we kindly ask you to mute your microphones and switch off videos to avoid any interruption during the session. So, uh, today our session is on, the session is the Vaishnav doctor. So, now let me introduce our speaker for today. Today, our resource person is Dr. Santusha Fernando, Senior Lecturer in Medical Humanities, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. So, without further delay, I would like to invite Dr. Santusha Fernando to start the session. Over to you, madam. Thank you, Maliti, for your introduction. And thank you uh, to the Sri Academy for inviting me for this uh, uh, talk and also to Dr. Charuni Kohomange, uh, who invited me uh, for this. Uh, I will go straight to my uh, presentation on the Vaishnav doctor. Uh, there were several questions before I even uh, came here as to what it is and uh, what do you mean by it. We will find out during my presentation. 621 years ago, in the 15th century, poet Narasinga Mehta wrote a poem called Vaishnav Janto, to which you will soon listen to. When it is played, I hope uh, you read the subtitles and the English translation. The reason that I have accepted this invitation uh, to speak at this forum is to explore the answer to a question with you. Who is a Vaishnav doctor? We will soon know. The reason I want to explore, the reason that I want to um, uh, give this talk is to answer a question. The background to this is such. The medical profession in Sri Lanka is facing an unprecedented challenge. This challenge could be called the survival of the profession as we know it. After two years of an escalated pandemic, our entire society has taken a beating. The economic deterioration that we encountered is affecting everyone. So far, for example, our outpatient treatment facilities in Sri Lanka shared somewhat 50-50 with the private sector. Escalating poverty would mean that people will have less and less money to spend on private sector health facilities. More and more people will depend on the state health sector. I'm sorry, there are some tech difficulties, so I will just... More people will depend on the state health sector in months and years to come. We would continue to face drug shortages and restrictions of the facilities we can offer. This reality will burden the patients and burden the doctors. Some of us will surely burn out. Some of our colleagues are, have already left the country and many are contemplating migration. A large section of society blamed the medical profession itself for the role it played and the role not played towards uh, the economic collapse, hunger, poverty, food insecurity that Sri Lanka is facing today. We cannot run away from the truth. The ground beneath our feet is shifting. More than any other time in history, in small ways and big ways, we are called for an epic moral reconsideration of who we are. Even if we, in our personal capacity, are not the perpetrators, there is a call from society for moral accountability from doctors as a profession. They are asking us to re-narrate our role in society. They are asking us to redefine modernity. They are very rightly demanding a moral awakening from all of us. So I want to explore the question and answer to this question. When we redefine who we are or explore the best we can be, is there a neurophysiological basis to this? Will science and psychology explain it? Can ancient wisdom connect with our present reality to guide us? Can arts and medical humanities help in building our dream doctor? 
Like the Beatles says, you may say I'm a dreamer, but don't forget Salman Rushdie, who got uh, attacked by uh, uh, a brutal uh, uh, attacker who got off a ventilator recently, once wrote, Zembla, Zenda, Zanadu, all our dream worlds may come true. So let's begin our journey to finding out who a Vaishnav doctor is. Most of you may have heard the word Subhashita, which is written in Singhala. For those of you who don't know it, it's a manual of wisdom uh, written in the form of four lined poetry. When we were small, we were made to buy heart some of these kavi or poems from the Subhashita. Many years ago, before the Subhashita was written in Sri Lanka in Singhala, the Subhashita, the Mahasubhashita Sangraha was written in India. The Singhala version was probably inspired. So in this Mahasubhashita Sangraha, there is a Sanskrit shloka which goes like this. Aneka Sanshayo Chedi Paroksh Artsya Darshakam Sarvashrilochanam Shastram Yasya Natsya Evasa. It means it blasts many doubts, foresees what is not obvious. Science is the eye to everyone. One who hasn't had science is like a blind. Unlike the Western models of thinking historically, the Eastern philosophy of thinking has been cohabiting science, arts, humanity, spirituality with ease. There has never been much of a doubt or much of a conflict between the idea of Shastra. Shastra or the science has been a part of life in our traditions historically as evident from this shloka. So what are the Shastras that the ancient scriptures spoke about? So the Shastras were the Bhautika Shastra, physics, Rasayana Shastra, chemistry, Jiva Shastra, biology, Vastu Shastra, architectural science, Shilpa Shastra, the science of mechanical arts and sculpture, Artha Shastra, the science of politics and economics, Niti Shastra, the compendium of ethics and rights, Yoga Shastra, Nyaya Shastra, Dharma Shastra, the, Shastra, the Dharma Shastra, the, uh, the, the, the science of uh, liberation, then the Karma Shastra, the Moksha Shastra, the Artha Shastra, Kavya Shastra, Sangeeta Shastra, Natya Shastra, the science of art, music, dance, acting, uh, the, the Kama Shastra being the science of erotica. So there was no conflict between science and religion, science and philosophy. Science uh, was a part of our, our entire imagination of this world. Why was it important? Because the patient who comes in front of you is a combination of all these shastras, when you know all these sciences, how people live, how people think, how people will behave only, can we understand the why the shastra, why the person in front of you as a patient behaves in a certain way. So the framework of my talk today is to give a background to the devotional song on which this talk is based on, then to play the bhajan Vaishnav Janto and uh, uh, discuss key features of a Vaishnav, to discuss the scientific basis of a Vaishnav, and also to discuss how medical humanities can help to achieve the key features of a Vaishnava Jana or a, uh, uh, of this dream doctor that we aspire. So what is a bhajan? First of all, the word bhajan means devotion or to river or re re to river. For example, if you say Bhaja Govinda, that means to revere Govinda. Bhaj Vishnu would mean to revere Vishnu. The word Bhajan also means Bhajana or association or sharing. The Bhajan Vaishnav Janto is known to be the favorite song of Mahatma Gandhi. Because of Gandhi's affiliation to the Indian freedom movement, the bhaj the, this Bhajan Vaishnav Janto became a song that is sung by millions and millions over and over. Bhajans usually uh, evoke the karuna rasa, the flavor of loving kindness, and ragas and or the tune constructs associated with karuna rasa, such as Yaman, Kamaj, Bhairavi, are commonly used melodies for bhajans. This bhajan, Vaishnav Janto, is based on the Mishra Kamaj raga. Those of you who are familiar with the classical Indian music might actually identify with it. Usually, bhajans are a part of all Indian religions, such as Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism and Buddhism. Now let's listen to Vaishnav Janta. Vaishnav Janta Tiene Kahi 
that was uh, Vaishnava Chantho, the bhajan on which this talk is centered, uh, centered around. Um, so uh, I, it is a very long bhajan with many stanzas, but I have extracted some, uh, some of uh, the key uh, messages of this uh, bhajan for our discussion uh, further into this talk. You can see that some of the, in the subtitles you would have seen, a Vaishnav is someone who understands the pain of others, the one who helps others, who into whose mind that pride does not enter, one who sort of praises 
the world, we will uh, discuss more about it. And the one who does not insult others, the one who sees others as equals, respects women, do not lie, does not lie, and uh, does not touch what is not theirs. So we come to the theory of the mind. The theory of the mind is an important social cognitive skill that involves the ability to think that uh, think about mental states, both your own and of those are those of others. The theory of mind suggests that a Vaishnav or a person or a human can feel the pain of the others, feel the emotion of the others. They can actually empathize with what is going on in the other person's mind, although that experience is not really happening to us. So this was uh, uh, established by the uh, by the mirror neurons. Uh, so the mirror neuron experiment that was carried out was uh, using monkeys. Uh, they first of all gave a monkey a banana and uh, examined the uh, neuronal activity of the monkey's brain. Obviously the monkey was very happy and the neuronal networks showed positivity and happiness in the monkey's brain. And the monkey actually got the uh, banana and they ate it. Uh, then, in the next stage of this uh, uh, experiment, what they did was that without giving the uh, banana to the monkey's hand, the uh, investigator ate the banana in front of the monkey and examined the neuronal activity of the monkey. It showed that the same neuronal uh, pathways lit up or they showed, so, saw the same activities that the monkey showed when he actually got the banana to eat, even in the instance when another person was going through the experience of eating the banana. So this is called the mirror neurons, where the neurons actually mirror the experience and the emotions of the another person. This goes to actually uh, support the theory of mind where human beings are probably and I, I think we know this, are uh, capable of empathizing and we can understand and respond to the emotions and the pain of others. So the Vaishnav Janto, uh, the, the Pida Parai, who understands the pain of others is actually supported by neurophysiology. Then who is a Vaishnav? A uh, one who helps others in their need. So there is a book by uh, Rutger Bregman, which is called The Humankind. You know, in the evolution over millions of years, uh, the, the, there were many uh, uh, other forms of the human, like the Homo neanderthalensis and all that. The, these kind of uh, humans had a, uh, probably even a bigger brain capacity than the Homo sapien. The way that the Homo sapiens are hardwired is actually to help each other and to support each other. So in the book Humankind, Rutger Bregman uh, goes beyond the Homo sapiens and gives a sort of a sociological interpretation to who we can really become. So before, uh, before the theory of uh, Rutger Bregman, people used to call the current Homo sapien a Homo economicus, a person who was very driven by, uh, uh, by profit or Homo profitus. These were just words uh, people coined to, uh, to explain what the human being is. Even if you go on social media, if we talk to people, uh, to each other, usually people will say that humans are such bad creatures. They are so selfish. They are profit driven. But we are actually hardwired to help each other because evolutionarily the, our survival was because we helped each other. And now they say uh, the, 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 our aspirational human is probably the homo puppy. Like a puppy it will be someone who is happy with each other, who supports each other, who has an emotional response to human beings. So who is a Vaishnav? Uh, we will go on to discuss who is a Vaishnav. In that list you saw Vaishnav is a person into whose mind pride does not enter. You know, there can never be a place where totally you are without pride because we are all um, uh, normal human beings and pride does enter our mind. But uh, the poet P.B. Alvis Pereira, uh, a, a famous uh, singular poet, uh, uh, wrote this uh, poem. I will translate it as well. Atambula lesin mata randavu uratalaya handunai sielu leda nomativa kutuhalaya 
ඔසු පෙති වගේ මයි දෙනෙතෙ යති බලය මලකට සුවඳ මෙන් ඔබ හොබවයි නිලය පිබි අල්විස් පෙරර ෆේමස් පොයට් රෝඩ් දිස් පොයම් අබවුට් හිස් ඩොක්ටර් රෝසා අ ෆෝරින් ඩොක්ටර් who used to treat him and he says malakata suwanda men oba hoba vai nilaya that means like the fragrance of a flower you know uh, you you hold the position of a doctor so lightly so elegantly you know you can touch the petals of the flower the stem of the flower but you can't uh, touch the Uh, the fragrance of the flower it is held so softly and so delicately by the flower and he says uh, do not hold this post of a doctor uh, with a lot of ego and with a lot of power uh, it, because it's very easy to get a god complex when you are a doctor when people uh, deify you people say you are like god people say devi ovage so you know sometimes pride enters the mind and you assume all the good you do to yourself and maybe not even to the medical sciences mm-hmm. so uh, when there is less pride you become a better communicator how do you listen to others first of all obviously you listen with your ears but then you can listen with your eyes too you can see the 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 emotions of the person the pain of the patient uh, the what the patient is not saying with his lips he might say with his eyes i think there's a famous love song by gunadasa kapuge which says de tole no ki de dene teliya venawa i think not just for a lover even for a patient what is not said with the lips might be said in with the eyes and also you listen with the mind the famous french philosopher henry bergson bergson said eyes cannot see but the mind does not know so this is the importance of learning our clinicals having the knowledge because if your if our mind knows the the experience of the patient but is expected from the patient maybe we will be more able to relate to the patient story and what he is telling or not telling and also i think medical humanity especially uh, play a big role in listening with your heart with empathy with kindness and with the intention to help but let's listen to a worker speech to a doctor written by the famous bertolt brecht he talks about listening with your eyes and with your heart and let's hear what he has to say to the doctor here is a worker speech to a doctor we know what makes us ill when we are ill word says you are the one to make us well for 10 years so we hear you learned how to heal in elegant schools built at the people's expense and to get your knowledge dispensed a fortune that means you can make us well can you make us well when we visit you our clothes are ripped and torn and you listen all over our naked body as to the cause of our illness a glance at our rags would be more revealing one and the same cause wears out our bodies and our clothes the pain in our shoulder comes you say from the dam and this is also the cause of the patch on the apartment wall so tell us then where does the dam come from too much work and too little food make us weak and scrawny your prescription says put on more weight you might as well tell a fish to go climb a tree how much time can you give us we see one carpet in your flat costs the fees you take from 5000 consultations you will no doubt protest your innocence the damp patch on the wall of our apartments tells the same story you can see bertolt brecht who did not live in the present times talks about the causes of the causes he says uh, you say that the stiffness of the shoulder comes from uh, the dampness uh, but then he's asking where does the dampness come from so now causes of the causes and social determinants of health is an established 
uh, uh, theory on uh, the causation of disease. And also he talks about the embodied inequalities, which is also a theory of explaining how to look at the, listen to the patients with your eyes. That means that um, um, uh, uh, he, he says that what, uh, what, what uh, makes our uh, clothes rags also makes, uh, de also deteriorates our body. So it is the embodied inequalities and the embodied poverty. So uh, these are the ways in which poets have redefined uh, who we can become and uh, the, the best that we can become uh, as doctors. That was Bert Albrecht. So who is a Vaishnav? The one who praises the world. Now the praising doesn't mean just uh, the, the the superficial uh, 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 idea of just saying good things, uh, praising what is even not there, just uh, mindlessly saying good things about a person. That is not what is meant by this budget. When you say the one who praises the world, it means the acceptance of the world, being subjugate to the vastness of the world and the way of the world and the way of the life. Right. So a part of accepting this world is being kind to uh, yourself. Actually, in this entire process, from the day you start be becoming a medical student, something inside us is always breaking and something inside us is always making. By the time you come to the medical college, many of us have not even actually cut a chicken, but then we are made to dissect cadavers, dead bodies. It is a big shift from the child who comes from home to the dissection hall. So something inside us is always deconstructing and breaking. And medicine is always making you a, a tougher person, a person who's more resilient, a person who's more knowledgeable. Something inside you is always changing in this process of becoming a doctor. And even after becoming a doctor, being continuously exposed to suffering, death, failure, uh, when we lose patients, we develop something called the medical gaze. We dissociate ourselves from the, the organic pain of the patients and we uh, develop a, a medical gaze, a more detached, more dispassionate gaze. That is needed actually for the survival of professionalism and the survival of our mental health. But if the medical gaze become too medicalized, devoid of any organic connection to the pain of the patient, this making and breaking process of the doctor within him is in imbalance. So it is important to know yourself. And what does literature say about knowing yourself? You know, James Joyce, the, the famous Irish uh, writer, celebrated writer, once told Ezra Pound, his uh, closest literally ally, that geniuses don't make mistakes. They are often voluntary and they are portals of your own discovery. So the literature tells us to know ourselves. And it is very important to know ourselves because in our life, we talk to ourselves, I think, more than we talk to anybody else in the whole world. So we are always in conversation with ourselves. It is very important to know yourself, to navigate our life through this very difficult profession of being a doctor. So can uh, arts and humanities be an eye to the patient to accept this world, to praise the world? To be, uh, to, to be subjugated uh, to the, the way of the world and the, the, the larger philosophy of being accepting about the world. Uh, now, I consider um, uh, literature a reality simulates, simulator. Many things that are bad things that happen to uh, human beings happen to our patients, but they don't happen to us. And these things need not necessarily happen to us for us to have empathy and understanding. What literature, cinema, music gives uh, us the glimpses is, is the the reality of other people. You don't have to go through divorce, murder, rape, abuse to know what it feels like to experience those things. Literature, art, cinema can teach us and tell us what other people's life experiences are. Then you can accept and understand the way of the world and be a Vaishnav who praises the world. And it also gives us keys to other lives. It can, patients are fascinating people. And if we have already read uh, people who live differently to us in different cultures, different ideologies, different lifestyles, different beliefs, then we are very prime to other points of views of life. So if a patient comes and says, uh, because of my religious belief, I will not take a blood transfusion because of uh, the way I am, I will not undergo such a procedure. And I don't want to face death in the way you want me to face death. I want to go home and be with my loved ones. These are alternate frames to the way we are trained in medical colleges to treat patients. But if you have a close association with arts, humanities, 
cinema, music, these things will give you the other lives and the other realities and the other wonderful ways in which people live. Maybe they're sometimes even controversial, but it is okay to be different. And uh, arts and literature and medical humanities gives makes us citizens of the world. In this open society of the internet, where everyone has come very close, there is no such thing as an exclusive Sri Lankan, exclusive Indian, exclusive British or exclusive American. We are all a part of a larger network, of a global network. So literature, art, music, they teach us about other countries, other cultures, and they make us global citizens who can easily flow into other realities of this global village. And art, literature, music, cinema, they also teach us that there are consequences to our actions. They, there are lots of movies, uh, uh, literature about emotions, compassion, courage, empathy. And when we learn that there are consequences to our kindness and compassion, it changes something in the way we react to the patients and to this profession in be becoming better than who we actually are. In the introductions of Rutger's uh, book, Humankind, that I showed earlier, he uh, he uh, opens his book with a quotation, quote by uh, Anton Chekhov. Anton Chekhov says, show the man who he can be and he will be that. And cinema, art, literature, music, they show the best of what we can be. And if they show us what we can be, we know that we can be that, as Anton Chekhov once wrote. So also, one of the main features of a life of a doctor is failure. You can fail in many things as a doctor. First of all, very simply, you can fail many exams as a student or, or as a doctor. And then there are failures that we uh, we personalize. We, we might lose a patient. We might feel that we failed in giving the best care. We might think that we uh, um, we have uh, we have faced. A grave failure and uh, while we are going through this life we can even have personal failures which will reflect into our life as a doctor but uh, but poems like Invictus by William Ernest Henley, Henley uh, teach us how to face failure we will now listen to that taking a few moments Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole. I think whatever God there may be, for my unconquerable soul. The fell clutch of circumstance, I have not cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of fate, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears, the looms but the shadow of the shade. Yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. matters not how straight the gate, how punishment charged the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. by uh, was Invictus by uh, William Henley. And uh, it is one of my favorite poems. And I think you can even take a little time to explore this uh, poem yourself, because there is no life uh, uh, of a doctor which does not uh, show some uh, experience, some kind of a failure, and we all have to reconcile uh, with it. Uh, then we go on to the next slide. Uh, so, uh, who is a Vaishnav? Again, the one who does not insult others. So, in our profession, in a day-to-day -day basis on social media, in real life, 
who do we insult who do we disparage who do we criticize unnecessarily or unjustly or even justly is it really needed to criticize you know as doctors we criticize our consultants consultants criticize junior doctors we criticize co-workers administrators and when we are not face to face and in the social media it is even easier to say things that you would never dare to say to anyone to their face and we also criticize patients we ask patients uh, sometimes like something very simple like asking a patient why did you bring your uh, father at this point he died because he uh, came late or you brought your uh, child only now uh, she is in icu because you uh, brought that um, uh, fa father mother or child late these sort of criticisms can mean the whole the crashing of the whole world to another person so how can we not insult each other? I think a deep understanding, being a Vaishnav, understanding the way of the world, understanding that people are diverse and being assertive only within the limits of civilized behavior. That I think is very important, something for us to think about. And for those who are, uh, and also in social media, you see a lot of racism, misogyny, um, sexism that the doctors um, they portray themselves with. And it is very concerning, I think, as a profession. Also, what about the nurses? Do we subject our nurses, the female, the largest female workforce, I think, to microaggression? What is microaggression? Aggression would mean like shouting beating up person, being violent very overtly, very openly. But microaggression is something that nurses in particular in our uh, health system face. That means uh, the, 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 the consultant uh, will also ask the nurse, why, why it is like this, why this BHT is like this, uh, like uh, in, in, in not in very overtly violent ways, but building up criticism, building up negativity. And even if something is not going right, uh, people, uh, the, even we uh, blame the nurses. Is this the way you are managing the ward? And why have you not, uh, um, why is it not going in a certain way? And what about the relatives of the patients? Do they come and uh, scold the doctors commonly or do they, uh, uh, do they, uh, uh, uh blame the nurses commonly usually they pick a nurse usually a female nurse to unleash their frustrations their anger uh, about many aspects of uh, patient care so nurses also uh, are governed under very strict uh, regulations by their own hierarchical structures uh, when they have to apply for leave rosters so we are working together in this environment with nurses and it is very important to uh, to not to build aggression on their life because that will really affect uh, the 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 quality of the care we give so a vaishnav is somebody who does not insult others who is a vaishnav the one who sees others as equals there is a very important role that uh, the the you know it, 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 these are very obvious things uh, treating each other people equally i think i don't have to preach to you but there's an importance of medical humanities in empowering doctors to challenge archaic values and dominant social narratives i think it is very important art plays a great role in doing this because if you go to netflix or you go on social media if you are looking at a, a certain kind of content uh, netflix or social media will keep suggesting that kind of content so when uh, when they, so it always usually it uh, presents to us the dominant social forces the dominant ideology but art gives an independent view about life and says no maybe everybody is saying this is so but there is an independent voice and opposing uh, dominant value systems like patriarchy colonialism linguism please go and look up what these uh, words mean uh, discrimination racism art can uh, art can always, always uh, oppose the uh, the dominant value systems, and this is something that we must learn from art as doctors, because uh, among uh, the, the, these kind of algorithm-driven realities that are manufactured to us, we as doctors should stay stay true to our humanity and what is right and wrong for the patient and there is this word called androgyny you know in the current context of a lot of feminism and women's rights and um, and, and and women empowerment that, that we talk about we sometimes our health system forgets the man so misogyny is um, is, is the the bad treatment of um, women but androgyny is the opposite word of misogyny do we forget our men who are uh, who are victims of uh, the the larger pr proportion uh, uh, of uh, our drug addictions, alcoholism, suicide, neglect from the health system uh, uh, to the men of our society. So while we 
fight for the uh, fight patriarchy and fight for feminism? Are we going to forget our men? Should we uh, then have well men clinics? Should we have clinics uh, for uh, to address the problems of the men in particular? So we must also avoid androgyny, uh, which is uh, something that comes when there's an imbalance of whose rights we are fighting for. Now, to give an example of how dominant uh, 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 social narratives have been uh, fought by poets, I will give the uh, example of Hafiz, the Iranian poet who lived in the 14th century BC. He writes about a man, a black mole graced his face. He stripped and shone incomparable in splendor as the moon. He was so slim, his heart was visible as if clear waters loosed over granite. He, um, you know, the our the dominant narratives say men should be uh, subjugating women. They should be violent. They should be assertive. They should be strong. They should be go-getters. We don't compare a man to the moon. We do not uh, compare him to the, the tenderness within him. We do not uh, uh, usually uh, compare them to their inner softness. But all men and women in this world have a soft core and they have their vulnerability and see for in the 14th century, several centuries ago, uh, how an Iranian poet is capturing the beauty, the tenderness, the vulnerability of man opposing the dominant value system. A few centuries later, um, uh, Mahagama Sekara writes for the Nala Damayanti uh, ballet uh, at the Khandukara Himawarane, Sita Chandana Lapalu Sevane, Sulang Dalle Pavene, Ohogenameve. And he, he, he describes the, the, the Prince Nala, a man, a man writing about a man in the most tender, most beautiful, most poetic terms, opposing the dominant uh, uh, idea of what a male should be. And he also says, Saragi nil nuan bandunin nura from the tumblers of his blue, tumblers uh, of his blue eyes, erotica is overflowing. So, and after a few decades later, Professor Sunilari Ratna writes, Nila Nuan Yuka Kaviak Obage. So he also uh, compares the eyes of a man to, to, to poetry, uh, the blue eyes of a man to poetry. So poets have been doing what we have actually been failing to do, that is uh, not, not really failing to do, but uh, maybe not as um, uh, not done uh, as, as well as we should have done, uh, opposing dominant views, uh, siding with the human nature and defending human nature. And now we will go on uh, to listen to this. I will describe uh, this uh, after we listen. Sulagak ekka sulagak velunot ehema varada Bamarik ekka bamarik Gamana kiyot varada Turupat matata turupat Vetunot Mehedi Varada Kusumak Langadi Kusumak Ipunot Palm Varada Niahan India Ada in Velandagin Mululokia Oya Nimavana Hetty Hedai Itihasia Kauruat Nekisima Sangwadeak Anuragyat Ni Aparadeak Vimal Katipiarachi, a modern poet, uh, writing about the decriminalization of homosexuality in India. And he writes a poem to India saying, Dear India, you managed to do it, but here we do not talk about it. Talking about treating everyone equally, don't you think the medical community should be the ones to fight for equal rights of our LGBTQI community? And very recently, uh, a, a member of parliament um, uh, submitted a private bill for the decriminalization of homosexuality in Sri Lanka. How many consultants, how many doctors we have in parliament, don't you think one of them should have taken the prerogative to treat everyone equal and to be a Vaishnav Jana representing us within the parliament. None of them did it, but it is a, an ordinary member, a, another member of parliament who has done it. So these actually take home uh, um, the message to us that we should be fighting uh, for what is right, uh, uh, for what is right and to build an equal uh, world. Okay, so I will.
Right. So who is a Vaishnav? A Vaishnav does not lie. I don't have to get, tell you like not lying to patients, colleagues, administration, media is obvious. But I would like to bring to discuss this aspect of truth uh, with you. When the truth is replaced by silence, silence is a lie. So let's talk about a Vaishnav jhana, not siding with a lie, with their silence. Can you think as a collection of professionals, times when we should have spoken up, but when we remained silent. I give, leave it to your conscience to think of many times in the recent history, especially, which is uh, pushing our society to calling for our moral reconsideration. Don't you think there were times when, uh, when, when racism was used against the medical community and we remained silent, not all of us, but most of us. Uh, when, when social order was uh, disrupted in a very bad way, uh, as doctors, we had a role to play, but didn't we keep silent? What did, how did we treat our own? How did we treat our society? So are we lying through being silent? So who is a Vaishnav? Vaishnav is a person who does not utter lies with their tongue actively and Vaishnav is a person mm -hmm. who does not uh, uh, replace the truth with silence. So I think we have a social role to play in uh, being pro-science, uh, opposing anti-science, uh, opposing myths, opposing uh, regressive views. So not being silent when these things are happening in our society, we must fight for, the, for science and fight for human rights. So what, when, uh, what if and then we bring to the, this brings us the question, what if the herd is wrong? What if in some cases, unity is not strength? What if the dominant, uh, the, the opinions, the opinions that are propagated, the opinions that our colleagues are siding with is not the truth? Rabindranath Tagore has the answer. He says, walk alone. <laughs> Bakla Cholore Jodi Tor Dakshone Kyo Na Shi Tobe Akla Cholore Tobe Akla Cholo Akla Cholo Akla Cholo Akla Cholore Tobe Akla Cholo Akla Cholo Akla Cholo Akla Cholore So that is uh, Ravindranath Tagore, who gives us timeless wisdom about when the herd is not uh, speaking the truth, what do we do? Do people have the right to walk alone? Can people break away from our pack and find their independent path? And when they do that, how do we treat them? We treat them like a Vaishnav. If people have gone away from our association, our fraternity, we do not disparage them, insult them, take them down, uh, uh, sexualize them, uh, and uh, and torture them, bully them. That is not on. So uh, the, the Travindana Thagore is telling us here, if uh, the world does not listen to your voice of reason, then do walk alone. There is such a path as that to the Vaishnav as well. Then I come to the last uh, two slides, few slides of my uh, presentation. Uh, then who is a Vaishnav? A Vaishnav is a person who does not touch what is not yours. So I don't have to uh, preach to you about uh, 
uh, not stealing, you know, that is obvious. I, I need not preach to you. But you know, like uh, touching what is not yours. We know the play, the role that big pharma, the medical technology industry, there's a huge industry around medicine is uh, working. I don't have to preach to you uh, how to how the ethical ways of taking up uh, sponsorships, uh, fellowships, uh, uh, travel grants, uh, travel money from them. I don't have to um, uh, elaborate very much on that. I think those are obvious to all of you. Uh, so but I must say that if we are if you don't work and we get a salary that is touching what is not yours, that is stealing. You know, if you disappear from the workplace, you are making rosters in such a way that you are unofficially at home and getting a salary indicating that you work, that is uh, not a what a Vaishnav does. That is the one, uh, the one who does not touch what is not theirs is not that. Uh, so uh, you must, I think we must fight for a fair salary and uh, we should um, establish the dignity of this profession uh, so that we do not have to touch uh, what is not ours. And also another important thing I would like to say is when you, when a Vaishnav does not touch what is not theirs, do not touch what is not our ex expertise. I would like to introduce this term to you, epistemic stress passing, epistemic stress passer judge matters outside their field of expertise. We should doubt that trespassers are reliable judges in fields where they are outsiders. So a Vaishnav will try to remain within their expertise. That doesn't mean that you can't branch out and explore other areas, become uh, in, interested in other fields of science or medicine or to explore and uh, venture into new areas. But epistemic stress passing is trying to give opinions about things that we are not experts of that can lead to a great maladies, great disasters. So a Vaishnav is the one who does not touch what is not theirs. So when it comes to doctors, it is not uh, just the human body or the patient's body or the money or involvement with the industry. There is an intellectual dimension to not touching what is not uh, ours. And please uh, uh, try to read up more on this concept of epistemic stress passing. So finally, I will uh, leave you with the words of uh, Osler uh, from uh, in a, Oxford University um, uh, research, he said that humanities are the hormones, humanities are the arts, sciences, sociology, anthropology, cinema, music, uh, all these things co constitute humanities and medical humanities. In, in, during, in medical humanities, we try to explore the nature of society, patients, how they respond to health, and how we can become better doctors by getting perceptions and wisdom from all these areas of humanities to, uh, to, to make a, a Vaishnav doctor. So I just wanted to share that. Uh, Osler said humanities are the hormones. If the clinical sciences, which are very important, uh, is the meat, uh, the salt on the meat would be the humanities, uh, which makes it more flavorful, more humane, more empathic, and more uh, Vaishnav-like, if I may use the word. So now shall we, um, so before I go there, uh, let me, I thank all the Vaishnavs in this audience. If you have any questions, further questions that I'm not able to answer today, uh, uh, or if you have any comments, please, you can send them to my uh, email address. I thank once again, Dr. Charuni Kombange and Dr. Dinesh Han uh, to, for inviting me and for encouraging me to do this. I resisted a bit. Uh, so um, that is all from the Vaishnav doctor. I hope I have given you some thoughts to ponder on and some um, things to think about, about this world, about being a doctor, about our moral conscience, about our moral awakening, and about our future as, a, a, as professionals and the neurophysiological basis of it uh, behind this. Uh, so shall we now listen to Vaishnav Janto, the same uh, uh, song, the same bhajan with more meaning. Please see when you read these subtitles again for the second time, if it means something different to you than before. So thank you very much to the Vaishnavs in my audience. Be more. 
questions uh maliti am i to answer them or uh, yes madam there are a few questions uh yes uh all right uh, can i uh, yeah madam can can you yes. see the questions yes i think most probably um uh, she says uh, what is your opinion and advice to rebuild up positive attitude such as responsiveness towards uh, the patients during this uh, critical period i think uh, first of all um, uh, one must uh, i think in these sort of times uh, i take a systems view uh, on uh, on problems like this because these are problems beyond uh, our 100% control so i think one thing is to uh, improve our efficacy in um, uh, our uh, this predicament because the predicament is economic actually i think uh, you know from a, in a practical sense that we can actually revise the way we prescribe drugs revise the way we order um, uh, investigations uh, whether we can intervene to get uh, more things done at the um, uh, state funded sector and also to i think to be a sort of a comfort to patients more than anything else i think that doesn't uh, cost us any uh, money and i think uh, the the only way to uh, one of the major ways we can respond uh, to this economic crisis and the patients is by increasing our health system efficacy by being available to the patients by giving them more intense uh, service by counseling them, by listening to their pain, by finding out innovative ways, or maybe even using technology. Maybe if there is a full crisis, if we can't uh, uh, do uh, physical clinics, I think during COVID times we did do, uh, we incorporated um, 
uh, clinics, maybe it's not the uh, the, the teleclinics and uh, um, some kind of online support. Maybe that is not the perfect way of uh, handling a patient, but we can use our ingenuity, technology, and we can revise the way we uh, respond uh, to to uh, do that. And also to rebuild our positive attitudes, I think uh, one of the main things we can do is to open the portals of our brain to empathy, to acceptance, to enjoying this life, and to have positive attitudes. I think uh, one as as a person from medical humanities, I would really encourage you uh, to move to art. I mean, not always be on social media where there's a lot of uh, negative feedbacks about our profession, which really sort of uh, hurts our feelings a lot. Um, I, I think to move to more, more, more enduring ways of engaging with the arts and the humanities and to understand this society more. And um, another person is saying most probably due to uh, deification, some doctors tend to strive for life prolonging options without discussing the patient and family, the end of life decisions and care of life. And the doctor always suffers at the end of the day. Madam, is there a way to introduce a sympathetic discussion with family and relatives early in the treatment rather than late in the last moment? Shouldn't there, they, this be the ethical responsibility? For sure, there are uh, for, for several years, especially I think even through the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association Ethics Committee, uh, the end of life uh, narrative, like how we are going to do it and about palliative care, uh, end of life decision making. This has been a discussion in the medical community for a long time. I think this Tatsara Bijetunga is completely um, uh, on, on point uh, that uh, what, what constitutes a good life, one, what constitutes a good death is, should not be a medicalized decision alone. That is why we encourage you to engage in medical humanities and, and other social sciences, not just arts and the music um, and so on, uh, to, to understand uh, the, the, the legal uh, limitations uh, to doing so, but to, but to, uh, but to finding ways of, of going forward in, in these patients centered care uh, which takes into account their narratives and uh, I think uh, yes thank you <laughs> thank you very much uh, for everybody who has said thank you to me so it's uh, it's very nice that uh, most of you uh, came here to listen to this um, story I hope we all uh, uh, go towards that journey of being Vaishnav doctors uh, in this world uh, over to you Maliti thank you Thank you very much, Madam, for that interesting and very uh, eye-opening lecture. So, uh, so I would like to thank Dr. Santusha Fernando on behalf of GMO and Sri for giving your valuable time and sharing your knowledge with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Madam. So, we are going to wind up our session. So, we will see you on next week at the same time. Thank you. <laughs>